have a cat behavior for the next like hour, right? Yeah. Um, so as you just heard, I work with dogs and cats, but I love talking about cat behavior. Um, in animal welfare, we often like just focus on the dogs, we just focus more on the dogs, but um, you know, cats who are a little bit more difficult to place also deserve some attention. So I'm going to talk just about how uh, our behavior modification program works at Lollipop Farm, and then talk about just some of the most uh, sort of popular flavors of cats that we get uh, in terms of behavior issues, and um, then just talk about some general tips that you could use with any uh, of these cats to sort of make their time in the shelter a little bit better. So our feline behavior modification program uh, is, so I should start by saying, in the behavior department we have uh, myself and four full-time staff and two part-time staff. Um, we do a lot of different things, um, but feline is not is one of them. So for our cats, um, everybody gets one to two sessions a day, and it's five to 25 minutes per cat, depending on um, what their issues are and how long they're to engage, their boundaries and things like that. Um, and so far in 2019, we've had about 150 cats go through our program. Uh, just to show you a little bit of how we track it, everyone, our, uh, in our office, we have this board where the locations of all the cats are. And then the thing to, next to it to the right is something we've been using the last couple months, um, which is kind of like a habit tracker. So if you've ever used one of those in a like bullet journal or something, so each day is a column, and then each animal is a row. And so whoever, uh, we all come in at different times, so when someone comes in, they can look to see, oh, okay, Greg already worked with Fluffy, all right, Jess already worked with Stubbs, now we're gonna, okay, I'm gonna work with Caramel. So you can see who's done what, so when somebody's worked with, uh, for the first time, initials get put in their box and it's highlighted. So it's a really easy way for me to see, like, what days do we need more coverage, or like, how are things going in general? I really like doing that. Um, so I definitely would recommend that if you have a task like this, if you have multiple people involved in, and it's hard to communicate um, with everyone that's coming in at different times, I think it works really well. We also have a sheet that goes on the, uh, if the cat is in a cage or in an office, then we'll have this huge sheet that goes on their location, and that is going to have sort of what were the behaviors that prompted us to go look at the cat? It's going to have what is their behavior plan, what is their recheck date, and then every day when someone goes to work with the animal, they're going to write some notes on there. So um, behavior staff is working with these cats, and sometimes the volunteers or cat staff also working with the, with the cats, depending on the issue. So my one of my favorite types of cats to work with uh, are fearful cats. So uh, there's some a uh, little bit of time on this, and just. First off, what does a fearful cat look like? Um, because uh, you would not believe the number of times that I've looked at a cat who looks like the cat on the left there, and someone's like petting them, and they're like, but she's purring. She's purring. <laughs> she loves it. Um, how many people have cats who purr at the vet, even though they're terrified? Yeah, right? Ooh, that's a lot. Normally when I ask that, it's like 10% of people. That was like half. Guys, you guys have some, maybe you all just have like more cats than the average uh, <laughs> like, audience member when I talk about this. Um, so, no judgment. <laughs> uh, so anyway, a fearful cat could be frozen, stiff, posture, probably trying to make themselves small, but maybe trying to make themselves look big. Dilated pupils, we got the ears flattened or down and back. They're going to be avoided of contact, but not always. Um, so I see cats that we know are feral come in and we can touch them and so that's also not evidence for me when someone a staff member says but i could touch them that they're not feral sometimes they just stay frozen um, and that's their strategy um, so they are likely if they're able to to seek out hiding place they often are eating sometimes they're feigning sleep which means they'll be like curled in a little ball and you'll see that their eyes have a slit and they're actually like being fairly vigilant, and they're not really responsive to sounds or to touch. Um, and that's really bad if you see that. That means that cat's super, super stressed out. Um, and they could be hissing and swatting, too, so it could be a little bit more active form, um, even though uh, that the emotion driving that behavior is here. For us, when we see fearful cats, often uh, the typical history might be that they're stray, so we don't know their socialization history. 
Um, it could be a pet cat who just was escaped, you know, escaped from their home and they've just been out for a while and, um, you know, don't know, or they could be a cat who's not socialized to humans. Uh, it, might, it might be a large indoor group. So I mentioned this in the last talk, but we do get in a lot, a lot of groups of cats who are under socialized, but indoor. And so it's often, um, you know, really relative, passes away, and then all of a sudden the family discovers there's a large number of cats. Um, or someone's moving from their house, um, they can't take their cats with them, and they have many, many cats who are unsocialized or under-socialized. Um, and it's really hard, I mean, it's, it's not always, you know, it's sort of the typical thing of a hoarding case, it's not always a hoarding case, it's not always a hoarding situation, sometimes it's just, you know, you have nine cats, that's maybe not unreasonable, I can say to this audience, perhaps <laughs> not other audiences, um, but if you're, not one of us, not an animal person, you're a normal person and you have nine cats, how much time are you actually spending interacting with each cat every day? Uh, those cats might be pretty under-socialized. Um, and it could be that they're young and unsocialized. So that's my favorite kind. <laughs> I love them. I love working with little scared kittens. Um, and if we can get them young enough, they're really easy to turn around. If we get them a little bit older, we can see still do it in a lot of cases, but um, yeah, uh, we have a bunch of different strategies. Uh, so when we're looking at housing for fearful cats, we want to make sure that they always have a hiding place. And one question that I get sometimes is, well, when do I take the hiding place away? And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, they always have the option to hide. We want them to always have the option to hide. Uh, but we want to incentivize coming out. We want to incentivize approaching us. Uh, so once they start eating, maybe we're not going to give them the food in the hiding place for more than a couple of days. And now we're going to move it out so they actually have to venture out to eat the food. Um, we want to make sure that it's a quiet area if possible. So um, our cat holding area has been uh, renovated within the last uh, seven or eight years. And it's really great if you ever get to visit. Uh, there are several different rooms, and they're pretty quiet, and they all have outdoor uh, viewing access. So all the cages, um, you can kind of see through. No, but anyway, uh, if you look in the corner, you can kind of see the daylight coming in. So they can see out. They can get up on the perch on um, the shelf and see out. And we have bird feeders and things like that out there. Uh, but they are pretty quiet. We have a sound system that plays music throughout the day. Um, and for the fearful cats, like this is one, this is this is one of my biggest shelter pet peeves. Right behind putting cats and carriers on floors. Don't do that, guys. I saw one of my staff members do that the other day, and I was just like, Are you kidding me? It was her own cat, but I was like, He's on the floor. And she was like, Let me see. I was like, Let me see. This is either put him on the table. Um, anyway, rant over. I can't promise there won't be more rants. I get really excited about cat behavior. <laughs> um, so, um, I want them to be in a top cage. So if I get called in to look at a fearful cat and they're in a bottom cage, like, I know we want to minimize movement, like, it's really important to minimize the number of moves, and so that fearful cat should have been put in a top cage right from the start. So top cage is going to be a lot better for them in terms of feeling secure coming around faster. And then I do encourage you to get creative. So. Um, since I've been at Lollipop, I've been like, hey, can we have a shy cat colony? Can we have a shy cat colony? I just like a little room where we can put our cats who maybe we, we don't know their socialization history. They were stray. We're not sure. Or um, we know their socialization history. We know they're not going to do well in a cage. And I finally got one. Uh, we, they let me take over a bathroom <laughs> to turn into a shy cat colony. Uh, and what that looks like, so this is when it was under construction. So we have these two side-by-side -side bathrooms. And our maintenance department built a, a door so we can have an airlock into the second bathroom. So they put kind of a, like a screen door on that um, with a glass front. And um, we took over the bathroom. So we put shelves out to a vertical territory. We have cat trees or shelving um, in other places. We, they actually have a window in there, so they do have out access to natural light. Um, we're putting a camera in there. Actually, the camera should be going in today. Uh, we've been we uh, started this last October and it's been really successful so far. 
it does take a long time. So part of why I've always wanted the shy cat colony is that a lot of these fearful guys need time and they need space. And those are two things that are really, really limited in most shelters. And so when we have this super quiet area, they're in a bathroom, they have the time, they have the space, we can really take our time with these guys. So some of them are staying in the shy cat colony for several weeks. Um, and then moving to offices or moving to adoption cages to go up for adoption. But because it was a new space, basically we were like, let's see how it goes. So the length of stay can be pretty high for our shy cat friends in this room. Um, but these were cats who would maybe be put into working cat programs. Otherwise, we were finding out that they were actually pet cats who could go into homes. And not that working cat homes aren't great, but some of these guys, it turns out, definitely would prefer to live in houses. Um, and so it's just been a really fun program and really um, inter interesting to see how some of these cats who would have been diverted into one track can actually get diverted into an adoption track just after some time and space and quiet uh, behavior modification. Yes? Can I just confirm when you're saying quality, you mean there are more than one shy cat? Oh yes, good question. So there, uh, the question is colony room more than one shy cat. Yeah, so per the uh, standards of care, and it's sheltered by the um, Association of Shelter Veterinarians. Uh, we use that, we do four cats at a time. Um, and we do try, we're not always able to do like all in, all out at the same time, but we try to minimize like, if we have two who are almost ready to go, like we'll have them stay for another week instead of putting two new cats in. Like we'll just wait and empty and then refill with four. Yes. And do you find that it's an advantage to getting them over their shyness that there are more cats in there or a disadvantage? So the question is, is it an advantage to have more cats in there or a disadvantage? It depends on the cat. Um, yeah, we've had, we definitely had cats where we're like, Oof, yeah, we know they don't like each other. Like someone needs to move soon. Um, and yeah, it really does depend on the cat, but a lot of times, especially with groups, like they're very used to other cats. And so, it is all about the individual. If we know a cat, a cat could be disqualified for going in there. If we know they have a history of not liking other cats, we obviously never put them in there. Um, and we, we don't put them in there if they're on a special diet, that kind of thing. So it's sort of the same normal colony rules apply. Um, but we're looking for cats with either unknown socialization histories, a known history of fear, um, or displaying really fearful behavior in a shelter to the point of not being able to be shown for adoption, um, but with a good history, yes. So I'm assuming that there's no public access to the Correct, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's no public access, so I'll talk about that too. So this is in, um, actually the, the bathrooms are in the lobby of our training center. Um, so, and it's pretty far from the actual training room, so they might hear a slight barking dog like once a week or something like that, but I don't even think you could from where it is, and I've never heard a barking dog from there. But it's a very quiet area, it's, there's no access to the public, and I actually don't even let the staff go in there, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, there was some controversy over that for a minute, but... Uh, basically, uh, since we were adding a space and we weren't adding cat care staff, what we did was I um, so sent out an email soliciting help with cleaning um, to the rest of the staff in the shelter. So. Um, I have people whose job is to fundraise, and they come in one day and clean the shy cat colony twice a day. So like it sort of provided a cool opportunity for people who don't always get hands-on animal care to come in and help out with that on a limited basis. But it also really, really helps because I was adamant that the people who are doing the behavior mod should not be the people cleaning. Because if you're cleaning and you're scaring and you're disrupting their environment every day, and then you're like, no, 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 I'm a nice person. It's going to take a lot longer. So that has been really helpful too, and it's been kind of cool. But no, we don't allow like tours to go in. We don't allow um, people to go in. So they're getting cleaned and fed twice a day. Uh, they get wet food and behavior modification sessions. They get other treats and food and behavior modifications. And they get two behavior mod sessions every day. And so some of the longer in the range of times of behavior mod, the longer end of things is usually the shy cat room cats. Um, so yeah, we have some wacky cats in there too. You can see that's Sloan in the corner. Uh, he was one of our longest residents. He was a stray. 
Um, we did not know for a while. I was like, guys, are we hand taming a raccoon here? Or is this a pet? Um, but he came around and started to um, be really, really friendly. And he just got adopted a couple weeks ago. And we just got an update email. He's doing great in his own weird, slow way. <laughs> Um, so each cat, the way that I like to keep track is they each have a membership card, and then when they move in, it goes into a binder with their daily record keeping log. Um, and then when they're done, the membership card goes back to me so that I can keep track of length of stay and in the room and how everyone's doing. And this is just kind of our first draft of this, and then a reassess as we go along to make sure we're doing things as efficiently as possible. So the basic behavior mod plan for shy cats uh, is to pair your presence with really good food and toys. So not going to leave one toys out in the colony for safety reasons anyway, uh, but I would only bring them out uh, when I'm in there or uh, sometimes track well toys too. Patience is key, so this is not like a fast process. Uh, I actually just did an in-home consultation for someone this week who found um, a cat with kittens under their porch, and they trapped them and got the mom spayed. The kittens are socialized and great, they're about three months old, and mom lives under a bureau. <laughs> and I was like, you know, it's only, they only had her for about three weeks, and I'm like, I can't tell you right now if she's, like, they wanted me to say she's a pet or she's a feral, and I can't, I can't tell you right now. And um, it can take a long, long time. So we are, one of our benchmarks is six weeks, so if it's been six weeks and we really haven't seen much progress, then we're going to say, okay, um, I think we might need to look at alternative placement, and then they will probably go into our working cat placement as long as we know they have outdoor experience. Um, but sometimes it's shorter than that. So you know we're a shelter, so we do have to look at things like space. Um, and so there are cats who have, don't get as much time and that would get diverted to a placement that's available. But if it's up to me, then we get at least six weeks with a cat. Um, we gradually offer physical contact, pairing that with the food or the toys. You want to take it really slow. Don't grab and hold fearful cats. Um, I, this is in particular popular with uh, kittens. People love to like hold kittens and just not let them go until they get in, and that's called flooding, and it can be really psychologically damaging, and it can result in a cat who stays around you, but stays like an arm and a half length away from you. And I've worked with adult cats um, in consultation who had this treatment as young cats, and it can be really difficult to convince them that like, you're not gonna get grabbed again. Yes? So I have a question about that. Um, I know you said you don't grab it, how do you cat that needs medication? Good question, yeah. So the, you don't grab and hold, but how do you do if you have a cat that needs medication? Ideally, that's a different person. So it's not the person who's also trying to be their best friend and do behavior modeling. It's a totally different person. Um, and we, I'll talk a little bit more at the, towards the end about low stress handling, but it's really important to do low stress handling with these guys as much as possible. Um, and our entire clinic staff is either almost done or done with their um, low stress handling certifications through the low stress university. Um, so they're good about working with these guys. If they need to do a more extensive exam, then they might get pre-medicated with the yeah. um, So they, the clinic is amazing with like working with us, with these guys, in particular with our shy cat guys, and sometimes it'll go in. So Sloan, um, the wacky, uh, beautiful one, uh, at, came out of the shy cat room into my office and then needed some, uh, basically like needed some topical flea and dewormer treatments. And so we just went in, I was feeding baby food, but it's, you know, touching, touching, squirt, like, so it's, we just try to coordinate with them and if it's something that's not daily, something like that, then we try to be there to facilitate if we... Does that answer? Okay. Yes. Um, back to your shy cat room, have you tried to see the difference? Yeah, so the question is, have we tried putting a socialized cat in the shy cat room and see if they come around faster? We often have cats in different stages. Um, so if one is like coming out, it's, it's almost harder to work with 
fearful cats if there is a really well socialized cat around because the socialized cat's like, what are you doing? Hey, you know, like, can I like jump in your lap? Can I eat that food? What's that? Is that food for me? Um, and so if we're working with like a group of kittens of sort of various stages, like we'll often say like, friendly guys, time to go, <laughs> goodbye. And so we can really focus on and actually access the fearful ones. So the biggest thing is like, you really want to give them choice. You want to make sure you're not forcing things um, whenever possible. Uh, and this was one of my, uh, another of my office cats, Pomona, who was a big friend. Um, and food is your friend, so you want to make sure you're using your food effectively. Um, so you're going to do what's called counter conditioning. So if you have a scary thing, A, and a nice thing, B, when B is always following A, the emotional reaction to that nice thing starts to get uh, associated with that scary thing. So if you always um, hit the doorbell and then give your dog like a steak, a juicy steak, pretty soon when they hit the doorbell, you hit the doorbell, they're gonna be like, oh, where's the steak? Instead of barking or being excited or you know jumping at the door. So um, it works really well. So you're the scary thing to a fearful cat and you're gonna use food. So you are there and then you're gonna give them nice food or toys. Um, and it does work in reverse also. So if you're trying to lure an animal towards something that's scary to them using the food, that can backfire. Um, and you know, to use another dog training example, so say you have a dog who barks at other dogs and you get, you're like, all right, I'm gonna bring the cheese with me so that I'm like really, you know, high value treat. And you see the dog, but the, your dog doesn't see them yet and you start waving the cheese in their face and then they see the dog, mm -hmm. like they're gonna be a little more suspicious of the cheese the next time around. They're gonna be like, wait, cheese, wait, where's the dog? Why am I getting cheese right now? So you wanna make sure you're presenting things in the right order. And I do wanna assure you, you cannot reinforce fear. So if you are with a fearful animal and you are giving them comfort or you're giving them treats, that is not gonna make them more fearful in the future. So um, if, you were really scared of spiders, and I put a big spider next to you, and then I gave you a hundred dollar bill. Mm -hmm. Like, then the next time I put the spider down, you would not be more fearful of the spider. You would be like, where's my hundred dollar bill? <laughs> <laughs> so I talk about um, a kitten that I worked with, Achilles, and he was a little bit more, uh, he was like popcorn kitten plus kind of, it was really hard to um, clean his cage in the shelter uh, because he was striking out at people. And he was in the shelter for a few days um, and then he went into my house for behavior modification. So this is a kind of a long video, but uh, I'll sort of narrate each day for you. <laughs> this is day one. And that's what he was doing in his cage also. My foster room is kind of a long, skinny bathroom, and it's gonna get progressively messier because I was doing spot cleaning so as not to freak him out. A little later. Good thing, but he's willing to eat. So I'm using a churro tube, which if you don't know about this cat treat, you should. Um, sponsor me, churro. Uh, <laughs> They're great, it's like really high value, cats love them, and it's like pureed fish or scallop or shrimp or chicken. Um, and I use a lot of these, or I use baby food on a spoon sometimes. Sure, yeah, C-H-U-R-U. -U. So here's uh, using a spoon instead. So basically I try to move my hand up the spoon or the churu tube so that it's more and more my hand getting the food and less the object. You can see here, he's already working. He doesn't, he's not at the back of the, of the carrier anymore. He's at the front. And what happened there was that I moved my hand a tiny bit. And he backed up and was like, nope. So even in these early stages, they notice everything. Like any little movement is going to cause that fearful reaction. So the more still that you can be, but still breathing, like don't be like, like <laughs> but natural, but like be aware of where your hand is. So here now we've moved to looking off my finger. I will say, sometimes they chomp your finger, so that's why I always serve the spoon in a churro tube. Um, but I have had 
actually a recent staff fight where the, they thought the you know giving two no with the finger and it didn't hit the finger. Um, so do use caution if you're chewing off your finger. And I like using pasty food because you'll see um, in another clip that if you're using like chunks of food, they can grab the food and then like move away with it. But if you're using a pasty thing, then they have to sort of stay where you are to get the food. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to push the boundaries a little bit. So each day or each session, and I was working with them two sessions a day, um, I would sort of push the boundaries to say like, what more can I get from you? Can I get a little bit further out? So see how he grabs it and then retreat back to his lair with his little chicken. So when I use that, I would really try to hang on to it. So the key is that I'm constantly raising the criteria for what gets the food, but at a rate that he can handle. So if like he was hissing and screaming, and then the next day I was like, no, you have to walk five feet all the way out there, he wouldn't come out there. But if I'm like, you have to walk three inches today, he can handle that. And then the next day I'm like, oh, so here is the toy and some touching. And he really <laughs> liked the toy. And he's a little bit confused about the touching. <laughs> um, and so this toy only came in on and you can see how much he loves it. But if I had tried to start with the toy, I would have gotten nowhere. I had to, I had to start with the toy. So we see him coming out with the carrier water. And in addition to these active sessions, I was also going in to just like sit and read sometimes. So here he's like. We forget about the toy. And I think this is an advantage we have of working with your uh, cats is that if you can get them to the point of getting some of that tactile stimulation, a lot of cats, like, it just invokes this response of, like, rubbing in and calming. Um, and in particular, like, that around the head and the ears and the cheeks, that's a really a nice place to start to hit. And with kids, too, sometimes I'll, if they're doing well, they'll do this flop thing to kind of flop over it. better postures from him, good things. So here now the toy is out, but now we're offering actually a little head <laughs> And I also, if you notice, I moved the toy out a bit more. And like I said, it's getting really dirty in that bathroom. <laughs> anywhere. So again, each day I'm just looking to raise the criteria. So if I was like, oh great, he'll come out and play with the toy, you know, he'll walk out of the carrier with two feet, and I just like open the door, I probably wouldn't see him again. So you really want to be patient with these guys, you really want to take your time. And at this stage, I'm comfortable in doing a little bit of lifting with him. So, you know, it's important if I'm gonna let a little cat out in the rest of my house that I'm able to actually get him and lift him up. So for me, the criteria for like getting a little bit of out of the box time is that I can actually get him up. And um, actually, so here we are getting to be like, oh, the toy is not as exciting as being petted. So it's all up to him, right? I'm just making it really fun to be around me. And I realized too in this clip, I'm like so embarrassed, but I'm wearing a cat sweatshirt and a cat sweatshirt. <laughs> Um, and the way that I usually do this, so this is the front of the bathroom, so now that I'm comfortable that I can pick him up, that he really likes approaching me for petting, I let him have a little bit of adult cat socialization time. 
And from there, we just start to expand his world, and here we have him like out in the full house, which is also pretty messy to be honest. But. <laughs> and he's approaching, this is a new person that he doesn't know, a new cat that he hasn't interacted with yet, and you can see he's very... Uh, okay. Yes, that's Grunk in my cat. We'll see her in another video. Uh, she is a little bit sassier with the kids. <laughs> Uncle John. And then Achilles, shortly after that, went into my office where I had a couple of other shy weirdo kittens already. Um, and you can see this was his second day. He was already making friends, socializing with the other cats, um, you know, exploring the office, approaching people. He did really, really well. And then he got adopted shortly thereafter, and he is in a really nice home. So his name is Philip now, and I emailed them, and I just sort of kept it like really open. I was just like, hey, how's it going with Achilles? And some of the things they said was that he's extremely social, he loves to be picked up and cuddled, and he does very well guess. So I didn't solicit any of this. I was just like, how is he doing? Um, and they're like, he, our other cat is such a scary cat, and he's like so brave. And I was like, oh my god. Um, so he, they have an older female cat, and she, if a visitor comes over, she'll run away, and Philip will be like, oh, hello, welcome to my house. <laughs> uh, so he went from this little kitten who you couldn't even clean his cage because he was screaming and trying to hurt you, and then screaming behind my toilet, uh, to this like wonderful, lovely lap cat who they said rides around on their shoulders. So <laughs> it's a really great outcome, and it just shows you like, you know, go slowly when you don't cut corners and you're not trying to force it, um, that you can really build this history of being reinforced for being handled. So he just, he loves being handled now because when he was little, it was really, really intensified. All right, moving on to frustrated cats. Um, so this is kind of our second biggest category of cats that we work with. And these guys are over the typical overstimulated cats. So they've got twitchy skin and ears and tail. Uh, they have dilated pupils or really round eyes, like a relaxed cat has like more almond-shaped eyes. They've got really wide, round eyes. They might be conflicted about contact. So these are the cats who like come up and rub on you, and you go to pet them, and they're like, no, with your eyes, pet me with your eyes. <laughs> uh, and they're probably at the front of the cage, like doing one of these, or like, hey, hey, like, you know, you're looking at the cat above them, and they're like grabbing your clothes through the cage. Um, they might have already gotten into a little bit of trouble squatting or biting. Um, typically, when I see this in uh, behavior consultations, people will present it to me as it comes out of nowhere. Um, and often, when I go to see these cats in consultation, they are just like hyped. And I'm like, oh, is this normal? Like, that he's like twitching, and like his whiskers are fluffed out, and he's constantly vigilant and like walking around, and they're like, oh, yeah, he's actually like a little calmer today. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, and usually these could be uh, an adolescent or a young adult. Uh, sometimes they are indoor outdoor cats or they were uh, fully an outdoor cat and now they're in a cage. And so they're just not getting um, that stimulation that they had before. So one thing to think about is housing wise, do you have a space that you can put them in that gives them more room? Um, so we have um, it's awesome, we have in our cat housing area mini colonies that we can use that have a bit more vertical space, a little bit more floor space than a cage. We also in our adoption area have portals that we could make the entire thing into like a big cat labyrinth if we wanted to, so we can connect uh, more than one cage using our portals. Um, and then making sure that we're giving them more stimulation. So you, if they, you can get them in a cage that they can see out, where they can access bird feeders or other things out the window, just giving them more stimulation. We also look at these guys sometimes for office fosters, depending on the office, because if you have an office that, it, it's, a, it's a delicate balance for an uh, overstimulated cat in an office, because if you have an office with a ton of traffic, sometimes the cat's just like, it's too much, and they're grabbing people's ankles. Um, and if nothing is happening, then it can be too boring. So you need to really strike a, a medium balance. We also use patios. So we have two big patios, screened-in patios attached to our big colonies, but we have a, a single one also. And if you're thinking of adding patios, I would definitely say add a single one, because then what we do is we cycle through like office cats, or if there's an overstimulated cat in a cage, 
they can go out on the individual patio and get a little bit of exercise and fresh air. And we want to make sure that we're giving these cats places to perch and climb. Um, so my two cats is, I said before, Johnny and Drunken. Johnny's a Siamese. He was a fearful kitten uh, who stayed, and Drunken was a bottle baby, but has had, she is much more in this camp of over, being overstimulated sometimes. So our beat mod plan for frustrated cats, making sure that they get daily exercise. So out of cage time to walk around or to play, even if you have an adoption meet and greet to let them out, and that's great. Making sure that they get cognitive enrichment, so we do puzzle feeders for our frustrated cats, making sure that we give them training every day, and I'll get more into those in a little bit. We also want to make sure that everyone is asking permission for petting and not over-petting them. So by asking permission for petting, I mean for a frustrated cat, if there's twitchiness, we're not going to touch them. We're going to interact with them some other way. We're going to do training. We're going to do play. But if they're looking twitchy, like I don't care if they're rubbing on you. But if they're looking relaxed, then we're going to offer a hand. If we get a cheek rub or a headbutt, we're going to give them some nice pets. Uh, and if you were at the last talk, we actually did one of our pet peeves videos about this, about how to pet a cat. So there's a little 90 second video on our YouTube page uh, if you want to check that out. So really, if the cat is twitching, no touching. Um, and the big thing, too, is don't punish aggression. So I see this in consultation sometimes. Um, people will uh, have, like, sprayed the cat with water um, or, you know, like, smacked the cat or something like that. And that can often make it worse. So if you're trying to punish this frustrated behavior, you're not going to make them less frustrated. Uh, it can really spiral. And this is just one caveat. So. Um, Remember that there can be an underlying medical cause to behavior, or there can be a, a medical factor that is affecting behavior. And you want to make sure that, especially if you're seeing like a specific canine sensitivity, that you're referring that to your medical team to rule out any underlying medical issues. So this is definitely the case if there's like a certain area of the body is sensitive. So you're like, I can cut this cat, but then when I get to the base of the tail, she turns around and slots at me. Well, I want to make sure that that cat doesn't have arthritis in her back or something like that. And it's not just that she's a bratty female cat, which is what I've heard too. Okay. Um, and if it's a sudden onset of aggression, uh, if the cat is declawed, if the cat's a senior, these are all things for seeing healing sensitivities or generalized overstimulation. And do you want to meet up with a medical team to make sure that that's evaluated? Uh, litter box avoidance is something that we don't really work on in our formal BMOD program, but I just wanted to touch on it um, just to tell you what we do. Um, so we rule out any medical issues. We have a specialized questionnaire that people, uh, that the counselor fills out with the person at the time of admission. Um, and we, we try to identify a trigger. So if we can't identify a trigger, um, we, you know, medical or behavioral, we will consider euthanasia depending on a couple other factors. Uh, we want to make sure that we use the litter bags in the cage, uh, and then we have frequency and duration standards as well. And I'm going to kind of keep going right now and take questions towards the end, so I don't want to get through everything. We have 20 minutes um, But we also disclose the history to potential adopters, we counsel adopters, and we provide follow-up support if needed. And we don't really find that disclosing makes them stay longer. Like, people are pretty optimistic about uh, getting them back in the box, especially if we are optimistic about it. Okay, so just want to get through some general strategies. So these are some things that I've mentioned before already, but I want to just show you some more information. For play, um, for overstimulated cats or fearful cats, you want to think about toy rotation. So for those of you who've ever fostered a fearful cat, like you know at night you're like, everything's in a different place when I come back the next day. Like they're playing in that room. So if you're like, no, they're just hiding in that box. I'm not going to give them any toys. Like, just give them toys. Put some toys in there. Give them the option. Um, and it's great if you can rotate so that they have new toys every few days. Um, and to that end, I love the following cheap cat toys. They're all great. Um, and if you're looking at uh, puzzle feeders, the website foodpuzzlesforcats.com is amazing. If you haven't looked at it, you should. Um, and then for wand toys, like I said, you limit the access, you wouldn't leave them alone with them anyway, and you really want to move it around in a way that's exciting, so think about feeding them out. We do not use laser pointers, uh, and I don't recommend them to clients. Um, the cat never gets to bite and kill the laser. So play is like hunting behavior. They want to do that full expression of hunting behavior, biting and killing something at the end. 
So especially if you have a frustrated cat, it's going to be really, really bad to play with them with a laser because they're not getting that stimulation of biting something. And then for my overstimulated cats, I'm also going to test catnip reaction because there's so many cat toys that have catnip in them now, sometimes it's hard to tell, especially if they come in through donations, we don't know. But sometimes the catnip can be very agitating to them, and if it's in their environment all the time, uh, that can be a, a problem. So I want to, for an overstimulated cat, I'm going to get rid of all the catnip for a couple days, see if it changes their behavior, and then give them like a big pinch of raw catnip and see how that see how they react to that. It could be a good thing if it chills them out, but if it makes them uh, more fired up, then we're going to eliminate it from their environment. Same thing with shy cats. Although if it gets them fired up, usually, it's sort of the reverse. <laughs> uh, so cats love clicker training. How many people clicker train a cat? Yay, oh my gosh, that's so many of you. That's crazy. That's awesome. Uh, the things that I like to do first, typically with uh, clients to children cats, is target training. So that's teaching the cat uh, to touch a part of their body to a target. Usually I use a chopstick and I have them cat touch their nose to it. Uh, but there are a couple websites here to check out with more step-by-step -step instructions. I'm just going to show you the basics of clicker training. The click is a marker signal, and then they get the reward. So they learn I have to do the behavior I was doing when I heard the click. If they don't do the behavior, nothing happens. They just don't get the reward. So I want to show you a video of a shelter cat. And this is his first session of clicker training. A few seconds of this. So sometimes it's hard for me to localize the treat at first and you have to kind of really show it to them. If they are having trouble, I like to put a dish in there and then I'll always put the treat in the same dish. So like they know, oh, I'll just go to the back there to get my food. So super simple, I'm holding the clicker and the chopstick in one hand. And when he goes to sniff at the chopstick, then I click and get him food. And they pick this up really, really quickly, like surprisingly quickly. Mm -hmm. My finger. So his day has just been a little bit enriched. He's got to figure out a little puzzle, a build a little confidence. Uh, it's great. So we do put your training with our fearful cats um, when they get to the point that they're coming forward a little bit more, we'll sometimes we're going to do target training with them, um, and we love to do it with our overseas cats. Uh, and then you can, oh, I'm going to keep going, but if there's time for questions at the end, though, but like remember your question. Um, so you can use it for more complicated behaviors. So this is Grumpkin, who I took her train to go in her carrier, and now we're working on a paw target after she's in the carrier. My eventual goal, and I've been saying this for a long time, and I need to just do it, is to teach her to like pull the door shut behind her. Because <laughs> um, I think that would be adorable. And she loves her carrier because we have trained her, so I love it. So it doesn't have to be just for cute tricks. It can actually be for husbandry skills. Uh, I want to touch briefly on Low Stress Handling and Cooperative Care. I did come up earlier, but uh, check out Low Stress Handling University. They offer a certification course, uh, primarily targeted to uh, vet offices, but it is great for shelters as well. Um, so we have a lot, all our clinic staff have gone through it, and we have a lot of other staff going through it now as well. And we want to make sure we're carrying all invasive handling of food if possible. And the general rule of thumb is you're going to towel more scrub. So when you do work on low stress handling, um, you can work up to things like this. And this is, uh, this is Johnny getting his nails trimmed. And you can't hear it, but he purrs while he gets his nails trimmed. And he's getting little bits of turkey after each nail. I love his little back feet, like, like you know. Uh, and I love playing this when I speak to um, like regular cat owners because they're like, I didn't know it could be like this. <laughs> it's just like boring. It doesn't have to be a struggle. <laughs> She's waiting for her turn. Like, how often do you see the cat to the house like line up to get their nails dressed? <laughs> so it's you know you can you can work up to this. And we've done a little bit of uh, handling like this for some of our shelter cats as well. If you have another person who can hold baby food or churu while you're clipping, and you have the food and the clips in a little bit closer proximity, that's good. We also want to start just with restraint and pairing that with really good food. 
So restraint and food, and then flip one or two is food. Um, so yeah, you can really achieve good things with low stress insulin. And then to talk briefly, behavior medication, uh, we do use it in the shelter. And um, what I will say is talk to your veterinarian or your medical team, or there's a couple behavior vets um, to consult with. So you, Kate Anderson is here at resident at Cornell, and Dr. Sarah Bennett was at this conference a few years ago and talked about using behavior medication in a shelter. And either of them will consult with veterinarians. So they're good resources to know. Uh, and I think that behavior medication in general in sheltering is going to become more and more prevalent, and I think that's good. I mean, it's another tool we can use to help uh, modify behavior in shelters and make sure that stress levels are appropriate. So uh, adoption strategies, so we use with our cats um, who might have a little bit more uh, needs than the typical cat, higher needs. Um, I talked a little bit in the last talk about how we do have a schedule. Our social media has a schedule for, okay, this cat has been here for this long, they get this photo shoot, and then they've been here now this long, and they get this video, um, and a couple other things. So they get a big uh, social media push if they've been here for a while. So Toronto is one of our cats from the Shy Cat Colony. Um, so he got like a cute little write-up and a cute little video, um, and he got adopted shortly after that. But we really try to be honest and like be funny at the same time. So we have had in the past had like a sassy cat special or like a feisty cat special, um, where it's like, oh man, we've got five like of these really tough like don't show well, overstimulated, active cats, and we'll like do a special where like that's the, that's the type of cat you get a, you get a deal on. Um, and it just sort of promotes them and it makes people aware of them. And it's really good for some of these guys to seek out cat people. Um, people who like self-identify as cat people often want to have a little project cat and um, you know, we want to give them a project cat. Uh, so, uh, we also, of course, for any of our cats who've been through um, our program, we're going to do pre-adoption counseling. So our regular counselors are going to be talking to them, and then if they have higher needs, then someone from the behavior team will also be coming in and counseling them, and then making sure that they're also getting post-adoption follow-up and free training help if needed. So from my perspective, I um, just like in the last talk, these are my two take-home points for you for cats. I think our role that we can, where we can get people, get affects cat behavior and affects cats, is that if we're you know promoting and teaching good foster kitten socialization, that's going to be really important. So kitten socialization doesn't begin at eight weeks. Like we're not thinking about like puppy socialization class. I'm talking about like you get four week old kittens. Like what are we doing with them now? Um, so making sure that we are raising good feline citizens um, and preparing them for their life in their new home is really important. And then educating the doctors about best litter box practices because that can be, um, it's so, it's not difficult, it's so simple, but people just don't know. They just don't know. So just making sure that you're educating people about the best practices. And there's a pet peeve video that I showed in the last talk. Um, if you want to check that out, it's on our YouTube page, so the Slide Pop Farm YouTube. Okay.